Welcome to this masterclass, Unlocking the Intelligence of the Afterlife. I'm Dr. Evan Alexander, former Harvard neurosurgeon and author of the books Proof of Heaven, The Map of Heaven, and Living in a Mindful Universe. My near-death experience in 2008 due to severe gram-negative bacterial meningitis that drove me deep into coma for a week's time changed my life forever in beautiful and miraculous ways. What I'd like to do is share some of those deep magical lessons with you here and now in this 24 module course. I now have come to see myself as an eternal soul on a journey with all other souls on a pathway of growth and understanding. And this is really all about the science of the mind brain relationship and the nature of consciousness and therefore the nature of reality itself given that consciousness is the only thing any one of us has ever known. And this is about uh, my growth and understanding that I think contributes tremendously to where the world is headed. Now you'll hear a lot of theory about from me, a lot of kind of theoretical scientific discussions and my modules uh, will cover a lot of the science, but they'll also cover uh, the richness of my spiritual journey as well as so much of what I've learned from other experiencers along the way. That path has brought me here to presenting this masterclass along with my life partner, Karen Newell, who is also the co-author of uh, my book, Living in a Mindful Universe, as well as the renowned and capable and proven medium, Suzanne Giesman. I'll be sharing with you the knowledge that I gained from my visit to the afterlife, which resulted in a complete flip in my scientific worldview. My coma happened about 15 years ago. And my journey since then has involved studying physics, cosmology, spirituality, religious systems, uh, everything I can read about consciousness and the various debates of the, in the philosophy of mind, and all the evidence that supports the reality of an afterlife. It has greatly strengthened my understanding of the nature of reality, uh, and again, with all of us as an eternal soul and seeing this beautiful binding force of love in which we all operate in helping to uh, basically manifest the world of our dreams. Now, science is well along the way to understanding that consciousness is fundamental in the universe and not just some epiphenomenon of the chemical reactions and electron fluxes in the brain, which is what the neuroscience that I had studied all those 54 years before my coma had led me to believe. This firsthand spiritual experience is what empowers each of us to become the highest potential of our soul. So in these next eight modules, uh, after my modules, Karen will help you to generate firsthand spiritual experience in profound ways. You don't have to almost die to know everything that I've learned, as we have demonstrated through our workshops given around the world, where I've seen many people through meditation come to a deep and rich appreciation of their spiritual nature and of their interconnection with the universe at large. Karen is the founder of Sacred Acoustics, a company that makes binaural beat uh, brainwave entrainment technology that helps people get into very deep states of conscious awareness. And uh, you'll have a, an opportunity to cultivate your own connection to your soul and connecting you with something larger, including souls of departed loved ones and the universe at large that has been witnessed by near-death experiencers going back thousands of years. And uh, after Karen's beautiful modules, you will then have eight modules with Suzanne Giesman, who will take you even further uh, with specific tools and methods that she's used as a psychic medium over the last few decades uh, to teach you how to get in touch with your spirit guides and the souls of departed loved ones. So in this module, what I'd like to do is share with you my transformation, who I was before, what I went through deep in coma, and uh, you know where I am now and uh, how those particular lessons can help any and all of us to come to a richer understanding of who we are. So before my coma, Harvard neurosurgeon, I had grown up in a scientific family. My father, adoptive father, was very influential in my life. He was a globally renowned neurosurgeon. And I thought I understood enough about brain, mind, and consciousness to have a pretty deep idea of the nature of reality. 
My near-death experience showed me I was only beginning and that in fact many of my assumptions that I've been uh, taught through this uh, culture of our uh, conventional scientific materialism were flat out wrong. So this is uh, how it all began, November 10th, 2008, when I woke up with severe back pain, 4.30 in the morning, thought if I made it down the hallway and could get into a hot bathtub, maybe I could alleviate the pain, but it only got worse. Almost couldn't get out of the tub and worked my way back to the bed where I collapsed writhing in agony and a cold sweat. And before much longer, I was going deep into coma. And in fact, what my family witnessed was my being in pain and a cold sweat. Um, my former spouse wanted to call 911 and I insisted, no way, I couldn't be that sick. No doctor wants to be uh, seen in the emergency room. And uh, the doctor here was already out. Anyone who uh, would hear of uh, severe back pain, severe headache with a medical education would think of meningitis. Well, I was far gone from this world, or at least the doctor of me was far gone from this world at this point. And uh, I was lapsing into coma with severe discomfort. Uh, in fact, I remember uh, kind of my last memory is when my son Bon, 10 years old, came in, rubbed my temples. As soon as he touched my head, I felt like he'd driven a white hot spike right through my, uh, right through my head. Horrible pain. Uh, but it was soon thereafter that I was going into a whole different world. Now, what my family saw was they thought I was sleeping, resting it off. So they let me rest for an hour or two. But then when they checked on me again, I was having the grand mal seizures. That's when they called 911 uh, and uh, had me uh, ushered off to the emergency room with the, with the ambulance. But I remember none of that. I was gone from this world from the very get-go. Uh, and where I went in that seven-day coma is uh, where I'll be going next. But the beautiful thing about it is there are tremendous lessons for all of us about the true nature of our being, that we are not simply material beings, but far grander than that, eternal spiritual beings that have this rich connection with each other and with a sense of purpose uh, in the universe at large. So much of the story that I'll be sharing now is there in the book Proof of Heaven. Uh, for those who haven't read it, uh, there is uh, plenty of additional information in addition to what I'll be discussing right now, but I want to give you the major elements of it to help you get up to speed uh, with why my journey has uh, uh, such importance, certainly to the scientific community, in helping us come to a deeper understanding of uh, brain and mind and the nature of consciousness. Now, an important feature of my near-death experience was that I was amnesic that I had no memories of Evan Alexander's life. I had no language. Uh, I had no knowledge of Earth or this universe. It really was an empty slate. And in looking back on it all in the months and years afterwards, it was apparent to me why that had to happen. Uh, why I had to be have a complete deletion of pretty much everything I believed before so that the universe could demonstrate straight to me a much more fundamental way of understanding the nature of reality and of my existence. Now, in this very amnesic state, I had no body awareness at all during any part of this seven-day spiritual journey. Now, it all started in what I call the earthworm's eye view, a very primitive course, unresponsive realm. It was like being in dirty jello. I have a, a memory of roots or blood vessels all around me, uh, these pounding sounds and these kind of dark and biological smells and all kinds of things, but it was a kind of a foreboding world, at least in the way I describe it. But to me, given my amnesia, um, it was just the way things are. So as foreboding as it might sound when I describe it to you, at the time, I simply accepted it as the way things are. The good news is it didn't last forever, even though it seemed to go on for a very long time, because what happened next was a slowly spinning white light that came out of those murky mists. And as it came towards me, I realized uh, that it had a perfect musical melody. Uh, and the melody was very important because in later stages of the journey, I had to recall the musical memory of those notes. And that's what would help me to conjure up uh, this light portal yet again. And so uh, it all uh, began with uh, that uh, kind of murkiness and, and this uh, light coming to me. And it opened up like a rich, beautiful uh, wormhole or a uh, a pathway, a passage up into an ultra-real gateway valley. 
Uh, and that was the big surprise because that gateway valley, an intersection point between kind of earthly realms and spiritual realms, uh, in many ways it's like Plato's world of ideals, but for the individual soul. And this is the region where we would undergo life reviews, reunite with our higher souls, uh, reunite with departed loved ones, uh, plan next incarnations, things like that. I'll be discussing much more of that bigger context as we go along. But this is the realm where that kind of thing would happen uh, and has happened for so many uh, indie ears and other spiritual journeyers going back for thousands of years. This gateway valley. Uh, it, it, I was a speck of awareness on a butterfly wing. There were millions of other butterflies looping and spiraling in vast formations, colors beyond the rainbow. And uh, in the midst of it all, this uh, beauty, what I noticed is down below us, uh, this fantastic verdant fertile meadow surrounded by a rich forest. There were crystal uh, sparkling waterfalls into crystal blue pools, uh, incredible magnificence and awe, a beautiful natural world, no sign of any death or decay. That was one of the most amazing things about it. And in this meadow below us were thousands of beings, dancing, joy, merriment. I remember seeing children playing and dogs jumping, incredible festivities. And it was all being fueled because up above, these pure orbs of light, spiritual beings leaving sparkling golden trails against that blue black velvety sky, the entire scene lit with clouds of pure color. I mean, wor words in our language really fail at trying to describe the beauty, majesty, and awe of these kinds of heavenly realms. And yet, uh, we can all experience the same thing through meditation. And that will be a huge part of where we'll be going with all this. And the gift that uh, I hope we will bring you with these kinds of, uh, with these particular uh, modules. Now, it turns out that I wasn't alone on the butterfly wing. This is one of the most important features. It's something certainly that those who've read the book Proof of Heaven are well aware of because this beautiful young woman beside me on the butterfly wing proved to be so important months later in helping me to identify the reality of this incredible journey. But I remember how she looked at me with this look of pure love. And she was absolutely lovely, soft of uh, uh, brown hair framing her lovely face, sparkling blue eyes, high cheekbones, a broad smile, high forehead. She was wearing the same kind of simple garb as all of the people dancing in the meadow down below. But it was all very colorful. Uh, really, color is beyond the rainbow, just like all the butterflies. And pretty much everything about this world was much better and more real and more alive and vibrant than we find in this material world. And that is one of the surprises, as people often think, well, in near-death experience, those realms must be murky and vague and kind of cloudy. Well, no, this realm, the material world in which we live in these bodies, that's the murky dreamlike realm. That realm, the spiritual realm, is absolutely shockingly rich, alive, vibrant with color, memorable, detailed, incredible to witness. And this is where the beautiful lessons of life uh, can come from for many of us uh, in meditation or in a deep spiritual epiphany like a near-death experience or a shared death experience, another topic that we'll be getting into shortly. Now, uh, it turns out that uh, uh, in this beautiful realm, uh, I remember a soft summer breeze that blew through. And given my complete amnesia for everything, including any religious notions, what that soft summer breeze was, uh, as I labeled it in my early writings, it was the breath of God, a divine wind. It was my first knowing of the presence and the power and the majesty and the love of that God force at the core of the universe. And that's what I experienced. And even though when that soft summer breeze blew through, the elements of the scene around me stayed the same, it turns out that my kind of perception and understanding of it grew much deeper through this awareness of the divine, of that loving God force right at the core of my conscious awareness that was helping to guide me in a loving fashion through this incredible journey. And I remember uh, her message to me. I think it's the central message that I was to bring back from my journey for the world at large. You are deeply loved and cherished forever. You have nothing to fear. You are deeply cared for. 
and you can do no wrong. Now, I wish in the book Proof of Heaven I'd expanded on that last statement a little better because uh, I thought that people would understand by that point how I was so completely absorbed in the ambience, that beautiful, infinitely loving force that I knew in that realm that everything I did towards love, kindness, compassion, mercy, acceptance to help my fellow beings and to show unconditional love was leading me along the natural pathway of my soul. But we have free will. So we have the choice to do other things. So in that sense, from a smaller perspective, there are wrong things we can do. Any of the selfishness, greediness, handing out pain and suffering to others. Uh, but what I witnessed was that ultimately, if we have this lo love in our heart and we let that guide our way, and that is certainly what guides the way through a near-death experience, then we can realize how connected we are with that God force at the core of the universe, with pure love that will accompany us and protect us and guide our journey of higher soul development. And that's what I was just beginning to realize in this journey, this message from this beautiful woman. She never said those words to me. She never had to. It was delivered telepathically. Uh, we had a perfect mind melt. Uh, and that was uh, that was a real gift. And as I said, uh, later parts of the story, how uh, uh, identifying that beautiful young girl in the butterfly wing uh, four months after my coma with a picture given uh, sent to me in the mail, uh, that's an absolutely astonishing part of the story. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. So uh, what happens is in this journey with this beautiful guardian angel on that butterfly wing, uh, witnessing this incredible uh, uh, joy and festivity, the angelic choir has provided yet another portal to a higher and higher level. And I remember seeing all of four dimensional space time, the lowest, um, uh, thickest realms collapsing down. And then all of that spiritual realm, that gateway valley that was so welcoming, so refreshing, so liberating, uh, such a spiritual home, all of that began collapsing down. And it's important to point out that uh, given that that is the region where life reviews can happen, um, that all of earth time can be compactified into, well, here, 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 and all at once that can be witnessed from the spiritual realm. That's what I mean by deep time or meta time. Uh, that ability to witness all the events of our lifetime simultaneously shows you the power of that spiritual realm and how it is so much richer uh, as a realm of possibility and of understanding compared to our material world where we march along through this drumbeat of time uh, all supposedly together. Uh, but it turns out that in this richer world, you can see uh, all the aspects of your life, even seeing other lifetimes to help you in coming to a deeper understanding of your soul's journey. And ha this is where the intelligence of the afterlife is so absolutely crucial to help us a, a grander idea of who we are and what this is all about. So the important thing here is that, uh, as I'll be discussing, discussing later, there is a medical case report that just confirms so much of what I report in the book Proof of Heaven about the damage to my brain. And in fact, that case report will go much further than I did in the book Proof of Heaven to show that all of these uh, incredible spiritual events in my spiritual journey happened at a time when my brain was most inactivated. And in fact, the uh, kind of medical parameters of my case in the form of neurologic exams, CT and MRI scans and lab values reveal to any uh, uh, neurosurgeon, neuroscientist, physician with experience uh, in meningitis and in, in neurology in general, that my brain could not have possibly generated a dream or hallucination. This is where those who are not uh, medically educated may be at a, something of a disadvantage, uh, but this is where, uh, for example, that medical case report supports my story so richly. Uh, and my surprise, how in the world could I have such a rich spiritual experience when my brain was so uh, powerfully inactivated by the disease? Meningitis is a perfect model for human death. And that's exactly what I was witnessing, was an inactivation of my neocortex and brainstem. And yet what I witnessed was this rich, incredible spiritual journey that's so memorable that I feel like the details uh, 
that I remember now are so rich and clear that the whole set of events could have happened yesterday morning. It's another thing about near-death experiences is uh, they change our lives forever and they are such an extraordinary reliving of events and kind of a living of our soul journey that it, they allow us to have a complete kind of upshift in our understanding of self and where we're headed. And of course, the bigger message of all of these modules is that you don't have to almost die to get that rich lesson by going within a practice of meditation with a certain intention and attention to various questions. You can come to the same kind of knowledge in your own way. But going back to my own journey, so on this butterfly wing with these uh, spiritual orbs above emanating chants and anthems and hymns that would just thunder through me. And with this new awareness of that divine wind, that breath of God that awakened in me the power of uh, that uh, God force of pure love and its healing and, and uh, kind of wholesome nature. Uh, and that's what I was beginning to witness. But this was just the beginning of my journey, as I mentioned, Gateway Valley was a gateway to what I call the core. And so I saw all of that deep time, meta time of that spiritual realm, all of that collapsing down too. Uh, following up this light portal through the angelic choirs uh, led me up into the core, infinite inky blackness, but filled to overflowing with this divine loving force, this God force that emanated through everything and especially in the core realm. And by this time, what had happened to where I'd come from is that it all had shrunken down into this complex oversphere that I think was there to, it was there to serve as a teaching tool. And entering the core realm, I was told in pure conceptual flow, but the words that I wrote down weeks later for that message of entering the core, you are not here to stay. We will teach you many things, but you'll be going back. And so the lessons would unfold in the core. I would then tumble back down to that earthworm's eye view. And again, it was by remembering the musical notes, the melody, that I was able to conjure up uh, that beautiful uh, light portal that led me into the Gateway Valley, always welcomed there by that beautiful guardian angel. Um, and then, of course, ushered up into higher and higher levels and the, the beautiful uh, uh, ushered up into higher and higher levels. Uh, and the beautiful uh, lessons of the core realm multiple times. And uh, those lessons are, of course, the, the subject of, of much of what I've talked about in the last 15 years, what we'll be sharing in these modules, uh, what I've shared in many other talks. Um, but the most amazing thing was the, that in that core realm, I had uh, this sense of that God force being the very source of my conscious awareness. And I would say, I think that is deeply true, that at the core of all of our awareness is that infinitely uh, co-creative uh, and loving force of God. And I knew when I came back to this world that God was a puny little human word with a lot of baggage. And so I initially called that deity Om, because to me, Om was the sound I heard deep in the core realm. Uh, people would ask me, what was the origin of that Om? And I would simply say, well, that was the sound that I would expect that resonance in this infinite uh, kind of infinite dimensional cavity throughout all of eternity, Om was the sound I heard. And uh, I realized that uh, it doesn't matter if you want to call that force of love, God, Allah, Brahman, Vishnu, Jehovah, Yahweh, Great Spirit. I mean, all of these names that humans have come up with do not remotely do justice to the power, majesty, awe, and deep loving personal nature of that God force. But that, of course, is what gifts near-death experiencers by the millions, going back thousands of years, the deepest lesson that near-death experiencers come back with is that there is this infinitely loving presence and that that presence is there to comfort and aid and take care of them. In their lifetime, in their soul journey, every bit of it, this reality of that God force is the gift that we receive by diving in. And this, of course, is the gift that doesn't demand a near-death experience. The gift of coming to know that God force at the core of our awareness is a gift that all of us have available simply by seeking it. 
centering prayer, meditation, living a life of love, kindness, compassion, sharing with others, uh, focusing on the highest good. This is all about the gifts that we can receive in a very practical sense from nurturing this connection with that God force in our spiritual home and seeking a real familiarity with all of that. Uh, there's no uh, religious kind of naming or uh, ideology ideology that fully captures or owns that essence. But each and every one of us as individual seekers uh, can come into a rich relationship with that God force in our process of uh, coming to know the soul that we are and coming to sense the deep uh, shared purpose and meaning that we have in our lives that can be en enriched through cultivating our relationship with that deity and with that force of love at the core of all of existence. Now, I was, I was promised that you will be taken care of, cherished, loved forever. That beautiful message that I said was the central message I was to bring back to this world. Well, uh, it turns out that I would make multiple passages uh, through, through these realms. Um, and then there came a time where, just as they told me, you're not here to stay. You'll be going back. Uh, and that's when uh, I, I tried conjuring up but through the musical notes of the melody uh, that portal up into the Gateway Valley, but it didn't work. To say I was tired or to say I was sad at that point would be a vast understatement. But what I got to witness then was the power of prayer. And the way I saw it was in the form of thousands of beings going off around me, off into the distance. Heads bowed like that, some holding candles, uh, arms in front of them. And there was this murmuring energy coming from them. But the murmuring energy was very surprising because until this point, I had found the, the bliss and the kind of deep uh, sense of spiritual home in the gateway valley and the core. But now I was feeling the very same sense of love and belonging down in this low murky realm, but it was offered up through these thousands of beings around me. And that's where I came to call that the power of prayer. And I came to see how people in the material world can offer prayers that definitely help and uh, encourage the beauty and love of the journey of the soul that is traversing. This is why it's so important to stress that prayers do get through. Uh, the prayers can help our loved ones as they depart this world. Uh, they can be very comforting and help and guiding. Now, uh, beyond this uh, beautiful image of all the power of prayer, what happened next was a vision of six faces that would kind of bubble up out of the muck. They'd say a few words that I didn't understand because my amnesia for language was still very active. And then they go back into the soup and be gone. Uh, the interesting thing is I can remember those six faces as clearly now in my mind as if all that had happened yesterday. They were crystal clear. And yet because of my amnesia, I didn't know who they were at the time I saw them. But this was all at the very end of the coma. It was uh, soon after that that I started coming back to this world. Very importantly, the reason I came back was the sixth face I saw. Now it turns out it was a 10-year-old boy my son Bond, but my amnesia was so thick, I still did not know who he was. But Bond had been told, Dad's sick, you know, but they tried to protect him from the worst of the, of the uh, medical news through that whole week. My doctors held a, a family conference on day seven of coma, and it was a Sunday morning. Uh, and that's the, where Bond overheard this news. And in the conference, they said I'd gone from a 10% chance of survival down to 2% with no chance of recovery. Uh, and that it was time to let me go, stop the antibiotics, take me off the ventilator, and just let nature take its course. Bond overheard this and now realized it was far worse than he'd been told. He went running down in the hallway into Major Bay 10, opened up my eyes, which had been taped shut. Uh, I was lying there on my ventilator as I had been for seven days on three powerful intravenous antibiotics. And he was pleading with me, Daddy, you're gonna be okay. Daddy, you're gonna be okay. As if somehow that would make it so. And I promise you, I did not see him with my eyes. I didn't hear him with my ears. But what I felt was this incredible sense of a soul who was connected to me and needed me. I needed to be where he was. I needed to offer whatever he was requesting. And yet I had no idea how to do that. But the good news is, is due to principles of resonance and through higher soul guidance, I was able to come back to this world. 
and, and uh, be there for him. Uh, but it was uh, very shocking when I first came back to this world. Um, I must say, <laughs> uh, first opening my eyes, fighting the ventilator, my doctors were absolutely shocked because none of them expected me to come back to this world. And yet here I was starting to come back. Uh, I fought the tube, they pulled out the breathing tube. I said, thank you. Uh, I don't remember uh, much of anything in the next 36 hours. I was kind of in and out of a uh, crazy, paranoid, delusional, psychotic nightmare. But that is uh, one of the most interesting facets of all this, uh, because I, I know that, uh, that I ended up uh, having a full return of memories over about two months. And in fact, a lot of my language, a lot of my personal memories came back uh, literally in the first few hours and days. That's how I was able to muster that thank you after they took out the breathing tube. But fascinating to me is the fact that the rich spiritual memories from the deep coma experience, when the medical data showed that my brain was so badly inactivated by the severe meningitis, those memories are sharp and crystal clear as if the whole thing just happened. And those memories from this 36 hour paranoid, delusional, psychotic nightmare uh, disappeared within a few weeks. So I'm glad I wrote things down early on. It shows us a big difference between the quality of an ear, a near death experience type uh, set of memories uh, and our normal memories. And there have been scientific studies of those memories showing how resilient and uh, 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 permanent those memories are from a near death experience. Uh, this is all very uh, kind of important in our ongoing story, uh, but uh, important for me to stress with you now that um, the music uh, was the engine of tra traversal through the spiritual realms. And that has become a very uh, rich theme uh, of my work since that time, using sound to revisit those realms. I've come to recognize uh, through this journey that hardships and challenges in life are the real gifts. And it's our free will choices and how we deal with such hurdles that allows us to uh, reveal that binding force of love and help us see how we're engaged with our fellow beings and engendering this kind of soul growth. But all through love, kindness, compassion, working for the highest good and helping our fellow beings. Now, the God force as the very core of our conscious awareness is certainly not something I learned in the Methodist church in North Carolina and growing up. And yet that was the richest, one of the most, uh, one of the richest and most profound lessons of my journey is that that God force is never distant from us at all, right there at the core of our consciousness, always uh, deeply present if we dive into that mental and spiritual realm. And it's that personal nature of it that is so impressive and is so healing. The healing power of unconditional love. This is really what near-death experiences uh, bring as their greatest gift, uh, in addition to giving us uh, uh, no fear of death. So I've used meditation, I've used uh, sacred acoustics, binaural beat brainwave entrainment for meditation for the last 12 years or so to revisit those realms that I first encountered in my near-death experience. And it's that revisitation that has taught me a tremendous amount and allowed me to interpret so much more. And this is where Karen and I have gone around the world giving workshops and uh, offering profound capabilities of connection to others through meditation, through learning how to use these gifts of love, the, the healing power of the afterlife, uh, to bring it into all of our lives. Now for me as a scientist, this has also meant a worldview flip, a 180 degree flip from the materialism or physicalism that I used to worship. That's the philosophical position that says that only the physical world exists or the material world, and that somehow the brain must muster consciousness out of purely physical matter. And that's where you really hit a wall because the hard problem of consciousness, which we'll be discussing in later modules, is all about the impossibility of trying to use materialist models to explain the origins of consciousness. This is why we need a much bigger model of reality. And that's the kind of thing that I'll be diving into in these eight modules that I have uh, to help uh, come to a deeper understanding of that. Um, 
And I would, would urge uh, one of the deep lessons in this discussion of going from materialism to idealism along all the possible dualisms or kind of other relationships between brain and mind that might be used to explain the nature of reality. Uh, one of the modern uh, theories that's put out there is panpsychism. Uh, the notion that there are proto-elements of uh, psychological experience attached to subatomic particles. And I can simply tell you that panpsychism is not the correct answer. It doesn't really give us anything new and that idealism and various uh, additional forms beyond idealism of panentheism is what we'll be discussing in future uh, modules here that will help us come to a cleaner understanding of how to make sense of all of this. Panpsychism is really a pseudo-materialist philosophical system that really doesn't help. So I've worked with scientists around the world in my efforts to come to this deeper understanding uh, in the last 15 years. Uh, groups, uh, for example, scientificandmedical.net, galileocommission.org. I invite you to visit their websites to learn more about this because I'm one of their advisors and uh, we're all kind of in parallel uh, in our uh, kind of efforts to um, show how idealism uh, and the kind of primacy of mind is really how the universe works. Now, in this discovery that the brain does not create consciousness and with scientific materialism finally disappearing, it's important for us to realize that the brain is not the creator of mind. Consciousness is much more than just the epiphenomenal result of chemical reactions and electron fluxes in the brain, uh, which is what I had uh, been taught to believe. Now, where did all this come from, this notion of mind over matter and this primacy of, uh, uh, of, of the mental realm? Well, in many ways, uh, in the modern scientific revolution, it all started with quantum physics in the early 20th century. And it turns out that uh, the best that many quantum physicists throughout the last uh, 100 years have been able to do is to follow the advice of David Merman, who is a Cornell University uh, quantum physicist. And he simply advised his colleagues, shut up and calculate. What he meant by that is don't pay attention to the mystery that is apparent in the experiments of quantum physics. And as uh, Richard Feynman, a famous quantum physicist, uh, said, uh, if someone tells you they understand quantum physics, then all you know is that you've met a liar. Well, I would say we've come a long way since Feynman, and that in fact we're coming to a deeper understanding of quantum physics now. But it means that we have to adopt this uh, knowledge of uh, what was apparent to many of the founding fathers of quantum physics back in the early days. And I will quote some of them to get us started, uh, but then we'll be diving deep into the experiments to go into actually what this is all about during these modules. Now, Max Planck, who is really the founding father of quantum physics in many ways, in 1900, investigating the radiation of black bodies, uh, what was called the ultraviolet catastrophe, he reported many years later what the findings of quantum physics truly said to him. I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. We cannot get behind consciousness. Everything that we talk about, everything that we regard as existing, postulates consciousness. Another quantum physicist, uh, Erwin Schrodinger, father of the famed uh, Schrodinger equation, which tells us how wave functions evolve and how to make quantum predictions about subatomic particles. Schrodinger said this, although I think that life may be the result of an accident, I do not think that of consciousness. Consciousness cannot be accounted for in physical terms. For consciousness is absolutely fundamental. It cannot be accounted for in terms of anything else. And uh, that from Schrodinger and in my discussions in my modules, I'll be explaining much more about exactly what he meant by that. Finally, I'd like to close with uh, another quantum physicist, Pasquale Jordan, who said, observations not only disturb what is to be measured, they produce it. So it's not just about human consciousness, but really the mind of the universe that we share. A direct interaction with the intelligence of the afterlife yields great benefits to the serious seeker. So my experience showed me the same as the quantum physics founders through direct interaction and communion with the intelligence of the afterlife, I came to realize that consciousness is fundamental in the universe, that free will is absolutely a quality we possess, and that our abilities to manifest and transform this world into the world of our dreams is something that is right there, the capability 
of our souls, of our relationships with others, with our higher soul groups, and the work that we can do as eternal souls to manifest the world of our dreams. <music>